good evening everybody uh, my name is venkat nakina i i am with the apd uh, welcome you all to this uh, webinar uh, the topic uh, for today's this is panel discussion on recent trends and challenges in spinal cord uh, uh, rehabilitation uh, we have uh, a elite panel from various fields and we also have a, a number of participants in this uh, webinar i i i cordially welcome all of you for this uh, 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 webinar uh, it is my privilege to introduce uh, mr jacob kurian who is the honorary secretary of uh, apd the association of people with uh, disabilities uh, mr jacob kurian is an accomplished accomplished professional uh, worked with uh, very big brands in the industry uh, both in india and overseas uh, and he himself is a brand is a very passionate is a very passionate uh, uh, a person when it comes to disability sector he is a person who thinks about this sector 24 bar 7 and uh, i have been very closely working with uh, mr jacob right from 2013 uh, that's when i got I first got introduced to uh, mr jacob in apd uh, with this introduction i welcome mr jacob kurian uh, to take us through the sub subsequent uh, program Mr. Jacob, over to you. Thank you, Nakina. Good evening, everybody. On behalf of the trustees, the governing board of the Association of People with Disability, it is my pleasure to welcome each one of you to this webinar on recent updates and challenges in spinal cord injury rehabilitation. The results of the work that all of you do in spinal cord injury rehab is is close to miraculous the combination of medical science its application via therapy and the combined with the indomitable spirit of our spinal cord injured beneficiaries make possible some amazing stories of recovery and rehab it is truly a shame that this work has so little awareness so little appreciation in the general public and so little financial support our chief guests today chitra and arvin are a couple who have believed in the cause of rehabilitating those with spinal cord injuries and they have backed their conviction and belief in our work with their own personal giving thank you both for joining us today It is also my privilege to introduce our moderator for today's panel discussion, Dr. Thelma Narayan. Dr. Thelma Narayan is a medical graduate, uh, did an undergraduate degree at St. John's Medical College in Bangalore, uh, then followed that up with a master's in epidemiology, and went on to do a doctorate in public health. policy from the london school of hygiene and tropical medicine she has committed her life to working for health and equity uh, and has spent over four decades in the field she returned back to her alma mater where she was a faculty member of the department of community medicine at the st john's medical college till 1983 and she co-initiated the community health cell a professional resource center in the voluntary sector in 1984 this initiative was registered as the society for community health awareness research and action more popularly known as sochara in 1991 she was the director of sochara's sofia or the school of public health equity and action and secretary of the society till september 2016 She currently serves as the director of academics and health policy action at Sochara in Bangalore. She has been an advisor to various national health initiatives, including the National Rural Health Mission. Was a member of the advisory group on community action for health. Was on the founding governing board of the National Health Systems Resource Center. Is a member of the National Asha Mentoring Group, and was a member of the National Mental Health Policy Group. She has spoken at and chaired several state, national, international, 
conferences and committees and has published over 70 reports, publications and papers. She is quite act she is very active in the people's health movement both in India and globally, promoting health, promoting the goal of health for all. The community health cell and Sochara are supportive of work with parents with of persons with special abilities. She is currently a colleague and a very valued board member at the Association of People with Disability and the secretary of CBR or the Collective Action for Basic Rights Foundation. I could go on and on um, because she's had such a distinguished career, both as an advocate and a practitioner, but time requires me to cut it short. Uh, my thanks again to everyone who's agreed to participate in this national, important national level webinar on the occasion of World Spinal Cord Injury Day. It's going to be the first of a series that we are doing with our partners. And we welcome you to what I hope and I'm sure will be a very informative session. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jacob, for that um, wonderful introduction. Um, I would, <laughs> uh, I would just like to say I'm just a human being <laughs> who's just doing my little bit. Uh, we are very fortunate today to have a very excellent panel with us, and to also partner with the lovely professional university in the running of today's panel session as well as um, setting off a series of webinars, which go right across September into middle of October. Uh, Dr. Senthil Kumar, along with the team, have put together a very useful um, set of sessions over the next several weeks. And we do thank all the participants who have registered. In fact, the response from participants has been quite overwhelming. It's much more than what we expected and it's reflective of the sort of need that exists in this country and the thirst for knowledge as well as the phenomenal need for work on um, spinal cord injury rehabilitation. As Senthil has been informing all of us, we have a huge number of people with spinal cord injury in the country and every year we add about 15,000 new persons with spinal cord injury to this group. So therefore, it's really a societal responsibility that we uh, you know, respond to this need with an evidence-based approach and through networking. So today, our panelists who come from diverse disciplines will be um, you know, helping us to know what is the status of knowledge in the country today, what are the gaps and challenges, and share their ideas of how we can go forward. So uh, may I request the screen share to move to the next screen? I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Monica Gulati, who is the Senior Dean and Registrar of the lovely Professional University, which aims at transforming education in order to transform India. She's from the Faculty of Applied Medical Sciences, from the discipline of Pharmaceutical Sciences, with over 130 publications. We really appreciate the partnership with you, Dr. Monica, and look forward to your uh, sharing your thoughts with us a little later. I'll just go through and in introduce all the panelists one after another before we move on to the next segment. Uh, the next scene. So we have Dr. Senthil Kumar, who is the man behind this whole uh, series and today's session. He has a PhD in rehabilitation and is the Director of Technical for Disability and Rehabilitation at APD. He has 21 years of national and international experience in this field, both in re rehab, research, and innovation, with more than 15 international peer-reviewed journal publications, and in, importantly, four intellectual property with two patents and two copyrights. His energy and enthusiasm and leadership have helped APD to move forward. Next one. 
Uh, it's a great pleasure to invite to uh, introduce Dr. Mohanti, who also has a PhD in medical science manual therapy. He's an associate professor and head of department at the SV Nirtar, which most people are aware of in Orissa. He's a member of the editorial board of a number of national and international journals and author for 72 publications. He's also authored four books in the speciality. He's been a key figure to establish wheelchair basketball, the state of Orissa, which is really so important in, in the work uh, for, with people with uh, spinal cord injury and other persons with disability. Next, uh, we have with us Mr. Sanjeev Padankati. Warm welcome to you. Uh, he heads the Department of Occupational Therapy, Education and Services at the Christian Medical College with specializations in occupational therapy himself. He has 26 publications of repute in International Review Journal and has co-authored a WHO manual on rehabilitation of persons with spinal cord injury. He has won this very prestigious award last year in 2019 for uh, for, uh, from the IOTA. Next. We have the peer, uh, Dr. Komal Kamra, a very, very warm welcome to you, Komal. Uh, she's been a remarkable uh, person who has, uh, who, and you will really love to hear her own life story. Through her peer counseling, she has touched over 20,000 lives she has retired as an associate professor of zoology at a well-known college in the University of Delhi. She has, been, uh, she has written extensively 40 international peer-reviewed journals, chapters and books on, uh, and a textbook of spinal cord injury. Uh, and she's talked about community inclusion after spinal cord injury. And this uh, comes besides her professional uh, uh, experience. It's also her own personal experience of having sustained a spinal cord injury in 1993. And she's continued her enthusiastic and energetic work on a wheelchair. She has co-founded Ekat Vam and the Spinal Foundation. But next, we're very happy to have <laughs> Professor Department of Mechanical Engineering from the well-known IIT in Madras. She holds a PhD in Mechanical Engineering from the Ohio State University. She heads the TTK Center for Rehabilitation Research and Device Development in IIT Madras and has over 25 years of experience in the field of assistive technologies, including eight years within the US industry. Warm welcome, Sujata. Next. I think with that, um, we have Dr. Samit, uh, Dr. Samit Chakravarti, uh, who is an assistant professor in neuroscience in the University of Leeds, UK. He holds a PhD in neurophysiology from the University of Cambridge in the UK with 24 publications and authorship of four books. He has won multiple national and international awards and has also been awarded multiple grants from the International Spinal Research Trust in Spinal Cord Injury Research. We look forward to your inputs, particularly on the field, in the field of research. With this, we move into the next segment with Mr. Arvind and, and Chitra. Uh, thank you, Thelma. Welcome all of you. I'm very impressed with the galaxy of speakers today. So many experts, and I'm sure we will see uh, and hear a lot of different perspectives uh, today from all of you. Spinal cord injury has always sort of concerned me. I'm uh, really no expert like any of you. But seeing how much can be done with so little effort, it is surprising that more effort is not being put in to solve these problems. As Jacob mentioned, not only is it underfunded, but the larger issue is that I don't think society itself understands uh, how much needs to be done for these people who have unfortunately met with accidents, which has led to spinal cord injury. 
and and as apd and a lot of you have demonstrated it is possible to make a significant difference in their lives right so i only, only wish that more people get started on to this and do more for those afflicted thank you thank you thelma or back to you thank you arvin and um, may i request dr monica gulati please thank you dr thilma and what could you know be a better day to start this kind of event than you know the auspicious teachers day i am actually overwhelmed to see the galaxy of the speakers the galaxy of the panelists who are going to share their views and in fact i would like to thank you all you know for making us your partners i think it is uh, going to be a long term kind of collaboration and long term kind of association with uh, you know the efforts of dr suresh mani and boy, i hope that this event is going to be a huge success there will be some very meaningful learnings out of this and i am actually overwhelmed to see the galaxy of the people here thank you so much thank you dr narayan thank you thank you very much uh, dr monica so maybe we will um, uh, maybe central can correct me if i'm wrong but uh, perhaps we can now set up start the panel discussion itself central yes okay so as you know we've had we have about three questions that we have put to our panelists uh, these are what is the current status of spinal cord injury rehabilitation in india what are the gaps and challenges in the current system of practice and what are the ways to drive effective spinal cord injury uh, rehabilitation in india in the next few years now we have planned to do this in around two rounds of uh, discussions in the first round our panelists will address the first question namely what is the current status of sci rehab and some may also deal with some of the current gaps and challenges and then we'll go th through the second round at the end we'll have some time for questions from the participants so with that i would request um, dr senthil to set the ball rolling thank you thank you dr thelma for your kind <clears throat> words of introduction and uh, acceptance for uh, moderating this session i'm humbly privileged to be part of the organizing committee and as a panelist the objective of this panel discussion and webinar series uh, is to draw attention to the increasing needs of spinal cord injury rehabilitation in the country and to highlight the role of multidisciplinary and multi sectoral stakeholders in the rehabilitation process in addition it is also to call for a coordinated and a concentrated national action towards strengthening spinal cord injury rehabilitation in indian healthcare system as we all know spinal cord injury is truly a devastating injury with profound consequences not only to the individual but his family and also to the society who rightly identified sear as a major musculoskeletal condition that represents a serious disease burden although remarkable progress has been made in recent decades in understanding the pathophysiology process of spinal cord injury qr still remains indefinable looking at the history i can say perhaps the only gain what we had from war is in the field of medicine overwhelming number of spinal cord injuries during the war has led to the development of dedicated facilities across the globe the helplessness of surgical and pharmacological treatment in the management of spinal cord injury has given a rise to a new field of medicine called rehabilitation over the past 20 years as a clinician academician and a researcher i would like to put my different views Uh, not only about uh, clinics but also beyond and uh, talk about the current trends under four major perspectives infrastructure and human resource the model of rehabilitation technology and policy in india the first organized program for spinal cord injury rehab was started in cmc hospital velour in 1966 by dr mary vergis who herself was a paraplegic as we all know followed by cmc the armed forces opened a center in pune in 1968 and later in 8, 1983 the indian spinal cord injury center was established understanding the growing needs and a need for a comprehensive bio psychosocial model and the importance of community reintegration very few cbr and institution based rehab organizations have started to emerge in the last two decades 
like the association of people with a disability amara seva sangam chandigarh spinal institute st john's hospital sahai and few uh, like ganga trust and so on over the years these centers have become a model institute not only for service delivery but also for human resource development research programs related to spinal injuries when i look into the second dimension intervention model previously if you look into the neuro rehabilitation of spinal cord injury was completely focusing on learning compensatory movements to regain the loss of function presently the good thing is we are shifting the focus of neuro rehabilitation from compensatory approach to functional neuro recovery the development of assistive technologies as augmented and supported the concept of neuro recovery through scientific concept of neuroplasticity technology plays a major role and it facilitates the intensive training process in spinal cord injury rehab and therapeutic technology such as exoskeletals functional electrical stimulation um, assistive technologies and robotic rehabilitation devices are coming into play while clinicians have an interest in incorporating these technologies that may that may promote neuro recovery into practice however the actual uptake of technology in spinal cord injury has been very low due to various reasons many of the evolving interventions and technologies were currently designed with the principles of motor learning and neuroplasticity in mind which is something very promising Uh, talking about the uh, fourth dimension called policy as we all know the the right of people with a disability act was enacted in the december 2006 it has lot of salient features that promotes and protects the rights and dignity of people with a disability in various aspects of life however the sca was labeled under locomotor disability whereby it loses its special focus and focus and attention organizations such as nina foundation mumbai and spinal foundation tamil nadu and many cbos dpos in this space i have raised this demand to the government which is creating some sort of resonance towards policy guidelines written to this population so by this i'll thank for given me the opportunity i will hand over to the next speaker thanks uh, central for really setting up uh, setting out the setting the tone should i say for this panel discussion with a brief uh, with a historical review as well as a state of uh, the uh, current situation I would uh, like to invite uh, next uh, Dr. Mohanty, please, to share your views. Dr. Mohanty. Dr. Mohanty, I think you are you have you have to unmute. Please unmute the mic. Yeah. Oh. Hello. Huh. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, thank you, madam. At the outset, I must thank the organizer for inviting me for this. webinar you know the incidence of spinal cord injury is increasing day by day and the young generation are the sufferer probably this is due to high speed bike use of mobile during the driving non adherence to the traffic rule poor road condition if the road condition is good you know the reckless driving by the youngster that lead to spinal cord injury and you know the management of the spinal cord injury start right from the spot of accident but there is poor transportation facility from the site of accident to the hospital you know the pre hospital care is very very important the realignment of the fracture spine the stabilization that is very essential due to lack of awareness the lack of you know medical technician with adequate knowledge in the spinal cord injury most of the incomplete spinal cord injury is converted into complete spinal cord injury you know only less than 20% people with spinal cord, you know with uh, fracture spine get the appropriate transport facility like you know ambulance from the spot of accident to the hospital and most of the people are transported either by two wheeler the three wheeler or you know even the truck then you know 
the researches to reach at the right hospital for the rehabilitation of the spinal cord injury you know it takes about one month to find a proper hospital with proper infrastructure and facility for the rehabilitation of the spinal cord injury and you know those hospitals you know they are usually they are present in the urban area and the rural indian person with spinal cord injury they are you know devoid of this facility then national highway accident relief service scheme nhars provide ambulance facility that is 108 and 102 to trauma patient within 1 hour of response time basic life support training and advanced life training ambulance and cranes are deployed in the national and state highway 24 into 7 hours to cater emergency services but you know it is not practically it is not available everywhere it is indeed reducing the secondary spinal cord injury improvement in medical surgical and rehabilitation in the field of spinal cord injury management has put great impact in the quality of life of the person with spinal cord injury inclusion of clinical examination like acr impairment scan serological biomarker radiological examination have made easy to understand the type of spinal cord injury and plan the appropriate management for it you know person with spinal fracture only 18 to 20% person with sp fracture spine develops spinal cord injury so appropriate management is plan planning of the management execution of the management is essential early spinal stabilization surgery made the rehabilitation process easier some centers they undertake researches in stem cell you know but the result till that the result is not that satisfactory the technological innovation in the field of rehabilitation including exo skeletal robotics partial support treadmill walking virtual rehabilitation functional electrical stimulation transcranial magnetic stimulation electrical stimulated cycling ergometer etc redefine the process of rehabilitation people tends to invest in this technology instead of focusing on basic physical health it restrain themselves from therapy and physical activities resulting in loss of primary health in terms of cardiovascular cardiopulmonary endurance and exercise tolerance for the rehabilitation of the person with disability in the government of india level there are nine national institutes there are about 19 composite rehabilitation center and the focus is to have one crc composite rehabilitation center in its state there are you know regional spinal injury center under the indian spinal injury center there are district disability rehabilitation center the focus is to have ddrc in all districts of the country that is under the ministry of social justice and empowerment national rural health mission nr hm under the ministry of health provide adequate rehabilitation services at district level but all these rehabilitation centers they are focused only in the district level the rural indians person with spinal cord injury they devoid de de of this rehabilitation facility there is no rehabilitation center available in the psc level so those people are the sufferer the introduction of sports and recreational activities as therapeutic intervention is the turning point in the rehabilitation of the person with a disability particularly a person with spinal cord injury you know when the somebody sustain at a young age there is lot of dreams when when sustain the spinal cord injury you know the personal life the family life the social life you know all is affected we come across number of patient 
young people with spinal cord injury with you know attempt to suicide and when they were introduced into the sports and recreational activities particularly you know uh, this uh, wheelchair basketball swimming then javelin throw archery so many sports activities you have included various recreational activities also we include so that what happened the life completely changed one of my person with you know lady patient with spinal cord injury she represented india in singapore and in thailand in wheelchair basketball competition you know one of my few spinal cord injury persons they are doing well in wheelchair marathon even 65 km at a time which a normal individual also cannot thank you uh, dr mohanty maybe we will uh, keep uh, some of the other uh, points to be raised in the next round may i uh, you you brought in a very fascinating um, view which provides uh, experience of the national um, you know processes and policies and programs and also the, what are requirements of people uh, you know who have spinal cord injury so with that i would like to um, a uh, request uh, mr sanjeev padankati to please uh, share your points you may have to unmute uh, sir yes so good evening everyone and uh, wonderful to see people who i know on the panel and again uh, thank you organizers for having me on this panel so the question that was posed is what's the current state of spinal cord injury rehab in india so uh, sendil did make a mention of uh, cmc being the first institute to start with the vision of dr mary wergis the spinal cord injury rehabilitation and uh, about 3 4 years ago we celebrated our 50th year so most of what i intend to say in, in this panel is based on our little experience and the collective information that i have gathered from uh, the others also so if you look at etiology most of us think that you know in india it's a road traffic accident that's causing uh, the reason for spinal cord injury which actually is not true at least from information that was gathered from various centers in india and presented some time ago unlike in the west where road traffic accident is the primary cause for spinal cord injury in our scenario the indian scenario it is mainly fall from heights and if you and most of it is during the time when the person engages in daily work working on high raised structures it can be climbing up trees it can be <clears throat> working on scaffoldings painters and this at the onset itself i would like to say which many people don't haven't realized yet that when we look at return to work a lot of times this emotional trauma of having incurred the injury during work hinders them from going back to the same occupation or a similar occupation now this spiral goes unabated because if you see all these occupations actually involve those from low socio economic status young children youth and adults under the age of 40 who still have a lot of productive life left in front of them are the ones who actually form a large group of this patients and most patients what happens is they exhaust all financial resources in medical and surgical managements before reaching rehab services and we all know that we have services very labor intensive it's time consuming and it's financially draining on the patient and with only a handful of institutions practicing comprehensive spinal cord rehab services it's a challenge and to subsidize rehab services becomes a further challenge for most institutes and that's one of the reasons why institutes haven't come up where comprehensive rehabilitation services could be provided i'm very fortunate to work in a institution like cmc velor where i think our institution got the policy right to be to look at disability or disabled individuals as a vulnerable group and was able to subsidize rehab services to the needy to the needy and the deserving i'm sorry i'm 
beginning my 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 uh, presentation with a lot of negativism but i think we need to build up the story from there the next thing is lack of qualified and trained therapists now i'm sure a lot of you will agree with me that you know spinal cord rehab is not as charming as when compared to other areas of work is challenging and it's physically draining and a lot of therapists do not venture into this stream unlike say maybe pediatric rehabilitation so there is there is this dearth of experienced therapists and in, a, in most of the centers what happens is the the question of affordability comes inside and you're not able to have more than one therapist a single therapist and if that therapist leaves by the time you get somebody in there's a huge gap and the strain and leave which is a brain drain is happening in all in all places in all professions now if you look at finally if you look at the rehab scenario you have a long waiting list for inpatient rehab services rehab services have been short, the admissions have been shortened which places a challenge on therapists to achieve goals set for example in our center we say 3 months maximum for the first admission for a patient with paraplegia and by the end of the 6th week we have what is called as a midterm assessment of the patient so these pose a lot of challenges because within a shorter time framework we need to do a lot of things so i, I think i have overshot my time so i will stop with this and maybe add on in my in my next uh, bit of presentation thank you sanjeev for bringing in the epidemiological evidence base about you know the causes of um, uh spinal cord injury and also the uh practicalities of the human resource uh, requirements may i request komal dr komal kamra to please uh uh share your thoughts uh oh, thank you organizers and thank you talma um a lot has been said and i um uh, allow me to go back to november 1993 when in a road traffic accident both my mother and i sustained spinal cord injuries hers was a simple crack in d12 and mine due to a crushed d6 7 8 was a burst fracture she went to a top notch hospital was immediately surgically stabilized and sent home in 3 weeks with an ivc without any awareness about rehabilitation and a pressure sore I went to an army establishment since my husband served the army and was conservatively managed for 7 weeks the idc was removed cic was introduced after trying to tapping to make local circuits which failed seats for rehab were sewn but without internet and without my, uh, mobile phones uh, i managed information from here and there and went back to teaching and research 2 years later adding more and more to my life including peer counseling for uh, persons with spinal cord injury and a national award in 2004 now that's november 1993 that was a scenario i'm just trying to say there were two types of scenes there fast forward to 2020 which is 17 what 27 years sorry has the scenario changed we do know about comprehensive rehabilitation but to count the number of rehab centers providing this i think i need fingers of only one hand india has an estimated 3.37 lakhs persons with spinal cord injury and it has been stated earlier 12 to 15000 are added every year and i'm dead sure that not even 10% of them reach a rehab center the situation is more or less quite like my mother's in most health institutes of repute and this has nothing to do with the urban rural divide right in a metro city a man falls from a scaffold the great sahab takes him to a nursing home puts the bill for an operation and the person is sent back sure to die you say it was fate in a village a person falls from a tall tree injures his spine no detection no treatment dies no birth certificate no death certificate i don't know if the names will ever feature anywhere so that's where we are right now over to thelma for the others to speak thank you komal we could listen to you for hours i think because i think you have 
made it so alive and so real and brought to our notice that actually the situation is still uh, in need of a lot of repair in itself. The health institutions as well as um, everybody, uh, you know, all the uh, others down the line. With this, um, uh, and we will look forward to your next round of inputs. Uh, may I request Dr. Sujata Srinivasan to please give, share your thoughts? Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be uh, here uh, on this uh, panel. Um, I will speak uh, here from the perspective of uh, assistive devices. I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, I started working in this field uh, back in 1992 when uh, um, I was doing my uh, BTEC at IIT Madras. And for my final year project, I was working on, a, uh, on something with CMC Vellore. And that's when uh, I was really inspired uh, uh, by Dr. Suranjan and the uh, uh, rehab team, rehab center at uh, CMC uh, to continue to work in this area. I went to the US. Uh, I worked uh, there for about 15 years and came back to IIT Madras 50, uh, in 2008 as uh, uh, faculty in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And one of the things that I first uh, uh, saw when I came back was, you know, when I looked at the state of uh, assistive devices, I found just like Koman uh, uh, said, you know, there was not much change in 15 years in the uh, uh, spectrum uh, that was available. So if you saw one end of the spectrum, you had the really low cost, uh, very obsolete uh, technology that's uh, available. Uh, in many cases, uh, people reject uh, those sort of devices. And at the other end, you have really high-priced uh, imported devices, which very few people are able to afford. And even if they are able to afford, many times they find that it's not really suitable for uh, Indian conditions. Um, maintenance becomes a big issue. If anything goes wrong, you know, you're stuck for probably months without uh, uh, being able to use that device. Um, so... The issue is, you know, for uh, spinal cord injury, if you look at even the basic wheelchair, um, every person with a spinal cord injury doesn't get one. You know, every year, uh, tens of thousands of wheelchairs are distributed, but not every person with a spinal cord injury has access to one. Leave alone one that is appropriate to that level of injury. Uh, the simplest wheelchairs that are usually the ones that are donated uh, they probably lead to secondary health issues. Um, they are poor fitting, therefore lead to bad posture, back pain, shoulder pain, all kinds of uh, problems. Uh, pressure sores due to uh, lack of cushions or incorrect uh, uh, cushions. And from an accessibility perspective, most places continue to be inaccessible. And the, since the, and the devices also don't seem to help because they're unsuited for outdoor use, etc. And with the donation market being the predominant way of uh, uh, getting these devices to the users, uh, there's really no feedback on whether they have actually improved the quality of life for the user, uh, whether it's made them more productive, whether it has made them uh, you know, reintegrate into society. So the fundamental understanding that an assistive device is really just something that should make you functional, that is missing. And therefore, you know, in the net, the net result is you don't see many people with spinal cord injury in workplaces or public spaces or you know, they are confined to their homes. And they're truly not rehabilitated physically, socially or emotionally as a result. Uh, and therefore, the stigma attached uh, to the disability uh, continues. So I will, uh, you know, uh, talk a little bit more about the challenges in the next uh, 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 round. So I will hand over to the next speaker now. Thank you, Talbhi. Thanks a lot, Sujata. I think you've uh, raised, uh, highlighted really critical issues right from, uh, you know, the type of wheelchairs and the feedback loops required for assistive de devices. Uh, with this, maybe I would uh, go to our last speaker for the first round, Dr. Samit Chakravarti, please. Right. Um, I don't know. Can you guys see me and hear me? I hope so. Right. So um, 
just as Sujata was describing, so I'm going to be, I'm a research scientist. I um, primarily study the nervous system in, and focus on the spinal cord, and hence my interest in spinal cord injury. I'm interested in the neuroplasticity of things. I'm, I'm not based in India, as it's obvious, probably. <laughs> um, but I have an interest in India because I, I, I mean, I'm keen to see how we can change things in the community, how we can make it really a functional tool that is available to most, as many as we can. So I started my journey in around 94 when I, uh, I mean, I, I'm principally an academic in my uh, basic construct. So I don't think about anything else but research. But seeing its translation is what led me to talking to Santal from some time back. And that's where this whole conversation began for me. How do we take it to the community? What is the best way? And something that Sujata just touched upon, and this is a, I raised this this morning during our local conversation, that one of my pet peeves uh, with the Indian science at this point is we tend to think what is happening in the West is the best approach. It's not necessarily always the best approach. We need to start thinking, just as we was pointing out, that we need to build things for that Indian environment. An interesting envi uh, scenario was we made some electrodes locally, which were made using a material called PDMS, which is sort of nice. It's used all the time, and it's commonly used. I was carrying it in my pocket in Chennai, and it became sticky. <laughs> So suddenly it dawns on you that what works at 20 degrees at room temperature here is not really the room temperature in a place like India. So we need to have that thought at the back of our minds. And I think spinal cord injury and all the other issues, yes, there is a strong amount of similarity. In fact, I would agree with Komal and I would be sorry to say that even here we have the same complaints that there is not enough clinicians and patient interaction in fact, we are trying to work on rehab systems where the patients can be taken care of from a distance. And that's become the theme, especially with COVID now. And the same kind of thinking is happening in India, but we need to ex push for those rather than trying to imitate what's happened in the West, assuming that's the best approach out. And I would stop there and we can discuss this further. Because I, uh, maybe, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Yes, thank thanks. You. Uh, thank and you. thank you for the chance, actually. <laughs> thank you, Samit. I think it's so important to have um, the academic and research perspective, especially translational research. And um, we will now go into the second round of, um, uh, you know, inputs from the panelists. And uh, we will again start with uh, Central about, you know, what are your thoughts about the gaps and challenges and the way ahead? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thilma. So like um, um, when, I, when we talk about challenges, the first thing comes to my mind is the data, the prevalence of SER um, as of other all other conditions also, like uh, particularly to a, a big country like India, it is underestimated. And unless and until we have a data, efficient rehabilitation requires proper planning and data. So to do this, I feel that we need to have a standard health information system where we can collect, collate, process process and manage relevant informations that are necessary for rehabilitation. So that's the first thing I would like to uh, talk about a challenge. The second, I feel like uh, as uh, um, Dr. Komal rightly mentioned, the specialization facilities. So though I said that I pointed out a few organization to scale up the services in spinal rehabilitation, we might require a multi-sectorial strategy, not only to respond to the growing demands arising from the incident and prevalences, but also to maximize the benefits of advanced in medicine, rehab, as well as assistive technology. So as we quoted, 20,000 new cases are reported every year. But when it comes to understanding of SER, infrastructure, human resources, I can say that it is almost non-existent. We have almost only around 500 dedicated inpatient facilities available across the country from small to medium and the large organizations for dedicated for spinal cord injury management. However, the number is 20,000. There is a very disproportionate um, ratio. This provides a necessity for us to infuse spinal cord injury rehabilitation into the national health development planning. And moreover, I, if the specialized care is not available, what is the next choice? As we all know, it's a government health system. So coming on to the third point about the government health system and spinal cord injury, as we all know, the health care infrastructure in rural India 
has been developed as a three tier system like sub center um, primary health center and community health center the first contact of a spinal injured either in the case of an emergency or for the treatment of secondary complication is in the last mile particularly is mostly the phcs and the chcs however currently the need is not addressed due to lack of capacity and resources there are no special units or beds allocated even at the district level centers most of the states do not have any kind of an specialized um, spinal cord injury unit which is run by the government in addition i would also like to emphasize that there is no national protocol for spinal cord injury management so if the system is not available what is the next so as we all know the cost the cost of the healthcare sca is very costly ailment the expenses incurred i could divide them into direct cost and indirect cost when i say a direct cost i can say the hospitalization and the rehab expenses which depends on the largely on the level of the injury as we all know higher the level longer the hospitalization required and greater the cost establishing a universal healthcare policy or a coverage could be a better solution to bring down the health economic burden in this population and when i talk about indirect cost what i mean is the the loss of uh, future wages and productivity and uh, one data actually like uh, interest us is that the incidence of spinal cord injury is very high between the age of 20 to 40 years which is called the most productive age of a person's life so again younger the age of injury higher is the indirect cost so we need better health, livelihood opportunities and financial support system for extended healthcare system for this particular population coming on to the assistive technology someone once said i remember if necessity is said to be the mother of invention then disability is grandmother less than 30 years ago when i look into the literature i can see only fewer than 100 assistive technologies available commercially however currently there are more than 30000 assistive devices are available in the database nevertheless i reminded of the parable of uh, three blind men who come across an elephant one finds the trunk and describes the animal as round and strong the second feels the body and indicates that it is large and heavy and the third feels the tail and says the animal is slim and flexible of course each man's observation is correct based only on his limited perception of the obstacle the provision of assistive technology today is not unlike the story replace a three men with an end user a health service provider and a technologist with each asking to describe the benefits and outcome of assistive technology if the researchers develop a great product but the healthcare system do not support its use and it is not accepted by the user then a lifelong worth work of work could be wasted so i would like to say that technology is the answer but the question should be asked by the people like their user as well as the clinicians also should be part of the technology when i say that what i mean is in the following contest i can say the first contest is a social contest economic reality often surpasses research for products that would only benefit a relatively smaller population even though the prevalence of sca is very high the reimbursement policy in terms of medical services or rehab services or even the complexity of the health system across the country prevents the progress of technology penetration to the last mile thus when discussing about future technology i feel that it is essential to look at the social contest when you talk about technology the second point to consider is the innovation process or the design process there are fewer studies which have shown that people with acquired disabilities like uh, spinal cord injury parkinson and stroke are less likely to accept assistive technology than with congenital disabilities and second thing as per the who on the world bank report disability and poverty go go hand in hand hence keeping these two points in mind the emerging, te emerging technology could consider frugal innovation which could bring down the cost and participatory design which has better user support and acceptance of the technology the third point in terms of technology is that prescriptions assistive devices as we all know is commonly prescribed by a rehab expert um, we have different uh, prescriptive models in place like uh, medical model uh, rehabilitation framework model and so on however considering the wild need of uh, spinal cord injury population we require a comprehensive model such as uh, i can say matching person and technology model where actually the technologist the client as well as the health care provider come holistically and we they can be able to drive a client centered model which could be the future of technology so listing on the fourth important point is research on innovation and technology as we all know existing and emerging spinal cord injury interventions and technologies could keep the fame as a framework when i say fame feasibility appropriateness meaningful effectiveness and economic evidence as a concept to evaluate the strength and gap in the outcome and impact of spinal cord injury research and technology if we have to scale up spinal cord injury rehab it needs greater awareness and advocacy increased investment into rehab workforce and infrastructure and improved leadership and governance structures the magnitude and the scope of these unmet needs signals an urgent need for rigorous and coordinated national action 
by all stakeholders. I strongly believe that this panel discussion and webinar series is an invaluable opportunity aims to bring together rehab stakeholders from health policy, clinical practice, users, funders, academia, research and technology to establish a joint commitment for action towards scaling up research services and address the profound unmet needs that exist in spinal cord injury rehabilitation practice in India. Our hope is that this discussion and collaborative effort will accelerate action in India to ensure rehab services are available for all spinal cord injury beneficiaries who need them. Once again, I will repeat, to ensure rehab services are available for all spinal cord injury beneficiaries who need them. We rely on the support of all of you to achieve this ambitious goal. Thank you. Thank you, Santhil. I think you've uh, brought to our mind the gross injustice that's being done to uh, persons with spinal cord injury by all of us, by all of society, but particularly by the state which has certain mandated responsibilities. I mean, we have uh, actually signed on to the Almata you know, Health for All Declaration way back in 1978. As we know, we are nowhere near it. And the COVID uh, response to the COVID epidemic has shown that we, are, we lack in many things. So this is a really important moment for us to strengthen our public health system. As you know, the trend is really for privatization at a policy level. And it's extremely important for all of us to actually raise our voices and join this uh, cause for universal access to health and healthcare that you were talking about, which is critically important. So thanks for raising very important points. We will move to the uh, to our next uh, uh, speaker, Dr. Mohanty, please, again. Please unmute your mic, Dr. Mohanty. You'll have to unmute. Yeah. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, the first thing is uh, creating education and awareness regarding spinal cord injury so that the incidence of spinal cord injury can be prevented to some extent by the social media nowadays. You know, you will find anywhere. People are all busy with this mobile phone in this WhatsApp and social media. If this awareness can be generated, how to prevent spinal cord injury, and people are educated, probably the incidence can be minimized to some extent. There is lack of trained emergency medical technician. So those facility has to be available. In India, there is absence of adequate affordable rehabilitation facility for persons with spinal cord injury. As a result, what happened? Various quacks, untrained people, they've misled the people in the name of technology. You know, technology cannot replace the physical activities and the you know the manual exercise program. So, and you know, the Indian people they cannot afford to the various technology also. Then the Rehabilitation of the person with spinal cord injury, it should be based on the individual basis, depending on the evaluation finding. It should be, you know, it should be planned properly so that the target has to be achieved. Then, uh, the, one of the common problems is the pressure, sure manage, pressure management which increases the cost and delay in the rehabilitation process. There is lack of or non-availability of customized cost-effective wheelchair, intermittent catheterization also, people are not well trained. Inadequate cushion in the wheelchair that lead to pressure sore. Then most neglected area is sexual and fertility counseling. And the next thing is lack of vocational training and community inclusion. So adequate trained manpower is a requirement for the management of the spinal cord injury, most multidisciplinary research and collaboration among the government and non-government organization is definitely improve the rehabilitation of the person with spinal cord injury. There should be a national spinal cord injury registry, including the professional, the technician, and the person with spinal cord injury, their caregivers. 
then uh, the planning and collaboration with IITs and NITs and other professionals for innovation of the new assistive devices. And it should be available to person with spinal cord injury at affordable rate. Biopsychosocial model, that should be the approach. So that what happened, the physical aspect, the, the felt need, and the cultural need of the individual and you know the social integration of the person with a disability can be achieved you know vocational training is very important you know the, some small groups among the spinal cord injury has to be made and various vocational like you know nowadays for everything we depends on china like the toys and for everything so if we can make the social group with the past person with spinal cord injury and they can be trained, particularly the toy making. You know, the another demand is in vocation is the food processing unit. If those can be trained and you know engage in those vocational training, they can feel themselves as a productive member of the society and that is going to change their you know psychosocial aspect of the that's all. Thank you Thank so you. much, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Mohanty. Um you raised very important points about socio-cultural um, needs also being res uh, responded to, and of course the physical, uh, personal sort of rehab besides the need for technology. May I request Sanjeev Padankati to share your views now in the second round. Sanjeev, could you uh, unmute and share? Yeah. A lot of you uh, on the panel have visited CMC well, and uh, yeah, of course, have good memories of uh, your association with CMC. But you know, CMC SCA rehab is an enigma by itself. A lot of people have visited as an organization, as individuals, wanting to replicate this model, which we don't say is the best in the country, but definitely it's a very time tested model. But what is really bewildering is. Very few organizations could actually replicate this model that we follow in CMC. And let me tell you very categorically, like the model that is in CMC caters to the richest of rich and the poorest of poor. And, you know, everybody who fall in between this. Now, as I said, you know, we have a very, very long waiting list. In fact, one of the longest waiting lists for admissions is in Rehab Institute. And as I said, we have to shorten our rehab stay, the admission stay, to accommodate more patients. So this has been a challenge to see what can be the most viable, best practices within the time framework that we have. As I said, if you take an ideal paraplegic uh, patients program, it's for three months. And you have a patient going through the phase of shock and you don't know how long the patient is going to recover from, from the post-shock period. And then you have the first phase of, of rehabilitation where you actually work in terms of disability limitation and um, you try and focus on building up the skills and capacity building in the patient. But what we have tried out over recent times is once this phase is over, the patient actually goes back home. And by going back home, what happens is he puts this capacity building that has happened at the rehab institute into real life situations, which is actually a method of performance enhancement. And then there is a period of readmission where he brings his whole baggage of challenges that, that the uh, that, uh, that, that he carries back from home, saying these were the challenges that I had when I, when I went back and tried things out at home. And then you actually go into a phase of skill refinement. The next thing is that we've actually tried out in, in, in Velo over the last 10, 15 years, is that we've tried, we've tried team approaches. So you have two or three professionals belonging to the same profession working with a close group of eight to 10 patients. We have two or three occupational therapists seeing about eight to 10 patients. 
Now, this has a lot of therapeutics in it. You have exchange of ideas for best practice. You have more hands to handle a problem and also the continuity of care. So when one person takes leave, you don't have to really worry. Now, another thing that we've constantly and very consciously tried to put into practice was we don't focus only to the injury to the body during this road to recovery. And it's just not addressing, you know, emotional, psychological, social, and spiritual needs of the patient. But also when, when it comes to the, to the correct phase of rehabilitation, working on things like effective communication, soft skills training, these are things that we've started. And we realize a lot of patients actually benefit from this when we actually talk about return back to work. Now, when it comes to focused, focused assessments or outcome assessments, We've always thought, as, as me as an occupation therapist, I know the physiotherapists have certain walking parameters for patients who are ambulant with, with calipers and crutches. Now, we thought, okay, with wheelchair users, what was it? So we looked up and we got this the wheelchair skills training protocol, which is a very standardized measure. Now, it's a, it, it runs for about four to eight weeks. We had to Indianize it to our condition, and we had to actually simulate, it actually involved you simulating um, experiences which, which can be close to real life situations, okay, which go beyond the boundary of the therapy room. So that's one of the one example of a focused outcome assessment. So you can actually tell whether the patient is ready on a wheelchair based on the basic skills training that is required or the advanced skills training. Now, patient reported outcomes. The limitation in medical practice has been or, or the, following a pure medical model is that we limit. The locus of the, or, or the locus of control is lost, or the patient does it not. It does. It's not within the patient, but it's in the hand of the rehab team. Sendhil made a mention of the of the of the biopsychosocial model. I believe the biopsychosocial model. The best way to look at it is all of us have come to understand the ICF. Now, when you read the ICF from left to right, from body structure function activity and participation, you actually follow the linear model of medical or the, or the medical model. But if you actually look at the ICF model from the right to the left, what are the participatory problems that a patient will have, which activities are limited and what should I work on body structure and function actually gives you a better planning on the biopsychosocial model. And if you actually look at, a, 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 if you want to understand patient reported outcomes, one good example that I can tell you is the COPM or the COPM. It's a copyrighted tool, but engaging the patient in deciding for himself, this tool is a fantastic tool. The next thing I wanted to say was, because we have an education pro uh, program also, we start our student training very early. In fact, in their first year, in their first few months of joining, we actually give them the experience of the concept of what disability is. We get them to put on AIDS, use AIDS and adaptations, sit in a wheelchair, wear a caliper, and experience what it means to be an able-bodied person, but to be restricted by these appliances. And, and what is the struggle a patient actually goes to? Now, we also get uh, the, the new students to meet well um, trained patients you, and interact with them in their naivety, ask them, ask them to ask questions and doubts. We tag patients and students during their clinical exposure. One month they spend with that one patient, understanding the patient better. And also we've tried to get our final year students to attend clinical rounds, which actually helps them in improving their repertoire of knowledge. The family as a co-therapist, there are many therapeutics about it. One best way is the family knows what is the exercises, what is the therapy, and what needs to be done for the patient when we engage them actively in the therapy process. Yeah, so I think with that, my time is over. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Sanjeev. I think I'm sure there'll be further sessions with you. I think they're very, very important and um, uh, very practical and useful points that you have raised. Um, we will uh, move on to Komal, please. Uh, most of the points that I had have always already been covered, but uh, I'll, I'll look at the gaps um, as far as medical practices are concerned. 
not my area but surgical versus non surgical cic versus idc versus cpc uh who has the choice i don't want to get into the intricacies but the choice is never with the patient medical versus social model the sci needs a long time hand holding until they cross over and even then for a lifetime so it's a, it's a, it's not going to be a medical no, model where you model. treat somebody and after that the person goes home uh, you know no, no, anyone yeah um the third important thing that i wanted to speak on was do we look at the system to do something for us we tried and then we said let people who have crossed over do something which will draw the attention of the system to the needs of the persons with spinal cord injury and that's where the spinal foundation was born so the spinal foundation was a collaborative platform is a collaborative platform with 20 plus organizations across india uh, the vision of course is to increase the quality of life of persons with spinal cord injury and uh, uh, networking using social platforms it can very very important for us uh, we we have we touch about 25000 uh, plus persons with spinal cord injury at um, central level as well as state level peer mentor programs where peer mentors are trained and then they reach out healthcare guidance all key areas of spinal cord injury such as levels of injury rehabilitation outcomes skin care etc etc uh delivered in vernacular languages so we have 3000 plus expert guidance the experts were guiding us on this uh the indian india spinal cord injury day the ideation and the plan was in 2014 uh launched in 2015 and then the concept was taken to an international conference where the spinal uh, world spinal cord injury day was <clears throat> it was converted um the anchor event was in new delhi with isic and expanding diverse events on september 5 even in small villages rehabilitation expertise to we start building show show the government show people that you can make a spinal rehab chandigarh spinal rehab came up this way it was just a group of us and and of course experts who did this enhancing the quality of rehabilitation with peer trainers at belor new delhi chandigarh raksol kolkata um and uh, four community rehabs in karnataka advocacy sensitizing the government uh, goes on but what we did was let's say for example we have one cat disability services about 15 persons studying at premier management institutes since 2017 have just been trained by people with spinal cord injuries i leave mobility devices uh, to sujatha i'm sure that's that's her forte a uh, covid-19 pandemic gave us a little bit of a challenge i mean little means huge persons with new injuries how do we tackle them we don't want to want them to go to hospitals so what do we do the first important thing of, of of course was to send the message and this message went the first guidance message went across india on 4th march 2020 when the number of cases in india were only 29 focused guidance social distancing stay at home physical distancing 6 feet detailed guidance notes went on further and further and replayed so that people don't forget why because we have reduced lung capacities so we might as well take care there's been only one person with spinal cord injury who's gone through covid-19 to out to the best of our knowledge and has recovered touch rehab was another thing independent living training actually making a team go right into the home of a person not not just creating videos and you know people following them but actually uh you know 
one to one call now do this do that do this this is right this is wrong and so on so one hour training uh, one one hour session at one time 20 persons have been are in the training process 24 are waiting to be trained this pro program we launched on independence day 15th august 2020 we continue to do awareness programs wheelchair marathons running probability awareness ambassadors and so on and so forth we need definitely i mean that's my last note from the medical model we need to shift to a social model and i must say something here what came to our attention when we looked at the mbbs curriculum there is a chapter on brain injury there's one paragraph on spinal cord injury and no question comes from that paragraph so as students nobody even reads and whom do you meet when you go to the uh, emergency it's that junior doctor an mbbs doctor an intern who's looking at you and does not even know what's happened to you can we do something about this that's my question and the answer of course lies if the system is not going to do it we're going to do it thank you thanks kohal i think you've done so much in your um you know in your time and uh, i'm sure that uh, this change of the medical undergraduate curriculum is something that you will take up and i'm sure all of us would be i would definitely be willing to support you on that it's extremely required actually uh, as part of the shift that you're talking about so um, we will go now to sujatha please for your second round of inputs Uh, yes uh, so i will again speak more from the uh, 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 devices uh, angle um so the gaps uh, and the challenges you know it's it's a very like they said disability and poverty go in hand in hand so it's a very cost sensitive market it's a very fragmented market and therefore very hard to reach uh, and therefore there's not a lot of incentive for private industry to invest in uh, uh the assistive devices uh, space and from the point of view of the users there's a lack of awareness on what a good assistive device is what is a good wheelchair what can it enable and as komal mentioned uh the lack of choice across the board you know right from the uh, treatment level to what device uh so for instance the government has the adip program why can that not be a direct benefit transfer to people so that they can choose what kind of device they want you know they can make informed choices rather than the government deciding here you take this wheelchair whether or not this is right for you and even with the devices it's you know this one size fits all approach a wheelchair is looked at as just a chair with four wheels you know that's like saying eye glasses are like two pieces of glass held in a frame would that make us functional no it would not so it's the same uh, you know it's the same problem uh, with the uh, devices with the mindset that okay what, there is one wheelchair and it will fit everybody that is not the case so there has to be um, a, an approach that uh, addresses these kinds of challenges and the lack of uh, appropriate therapy at the appropriate time one is you know not like uh, uh, not enough rehab centers with the holistic approach uh the other uh, thing that i have noticed is you know medical professionals other specialties orthopedic surgeons neurosurgeons etc don't seem to give rehab the respect that it deserves and i think that is a huge problem because if rehab does not happen uh as soon as it possibly should then you are putting the person at a great disadvantage um and the lack of skill personnel of course uh, so what are some ways to drive uh, you know to solve some of these problems um i think like for all the damage that covid has done i think one silver lining has been that uh, you know has been how it has normalized these remote interactions um and i think in that respect it has been a leveler of sorts because 
uh, people with disability for instance or you know who are uh, if you have trouble traveling it's no longer it's no longer you you're not asking for special treatment by asking for an online meeting or to participate in a gathering like this so the collaborative efforts you know with telemedicine tele rehab all that collaborative efforts and with uh, webinars like this collaborative efforts can really increase and um, i think we will be like like uh, komal was ta- talking about touch rehab you know reach the remotest places uh, to sort of handle these problems of lack of enough skilled personnel and you know train more people train uh, you know, uh, train uh, remotely so it it just opens up possibilities um, i know covid has turned our lives upside down but to me this is the one silver lining that i uh, see that this can actually in the long run make rehab more accessible to everybody who needs it um and so it's like uh, you know dr mohanty said it's not a substitute for physical presence but you can ensure that competent help can reach even remote areas and on a sustained basis as sanji was saying you're not able to keep people in the rehab center for longer periods because you you need uh, uh, the beds for other patients but this way maybe it can continue in uh, a remote fashion after they have been uh, given some rehab uh, physically so in terms of assistive devices also i think with google and with uh, whatsapp and all that the awareness about the need for appropriate technology is taking off uh, so that's a good thing um, and people are understanding that the right wheelchair you know can an uh, wheelchair that's designed for indian conditions wheelchair that's designed uh, uh, can really enable them a lot functionally uh, can make them more mobile uh, uh, access more places and it is possible i think uh, what we have done with the standing wheelchair and with Uh, some of our other things are focus at uh, iit madras at r2d2 is how do we use different kinds of development models to actually come up with affordable devices that are better suited to indian conditions we are realizing that you know it's not just about designing the device it's about how do we get it to the market to make an impact in an affordable manner and that is something that we have been working on that we hope more universities more academic institutions will start working on i mean i saw like you know uh, dr monica is there from lpu i'd be happy to collaborate with more universities we can learn from one another to see how we can expand this network so that uh, more um, innovations uh, come out in this space that are more suited to our needs and we also from the government perspective we need uh uh the right manufacturing ecosystem uh we need funding for this kind of translational uh, research to enable uh, uh better devices in this uh, space uh so this aware essentially awareness needs to be created about the need for early rehab sustained rehab and i think webinars like these can really go a long way in bringing people together for collaborative effort, efforts to uh, achieve this so we need more accessible environments we need devices that enable greater functionality and i'm not even talking about high tech devices not exoskeletons and such you know just simple devices that can enable better functionality can vastly improve the quality of life and enable people with uh, spinal cord injury to become you know productive dignified contributors to society Thank you. Uh, so thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much. I'm sure APD will try and take forward the possibility of um, a sort of stakeholder meeting uh, with in the not so distant future to bring together, you know, whether it's the academics, the private sector, and uh, uh, government to uh, for to continue this dialogue and to actually move into action. So with this, uh, I would request uh, Dr. Samit Chakravarti to please give your con- inputs. um let me start by just i mean just by saying that everyone seems to have covered most of the things that i wanted to touch upon excepting the research end yes one of the things that i was picking up is the interdisciplinarity conversation and my interactions with santil were on a uh, for 
a community-based database conversation, which was nothing to do with spinal cord injury. And that's where we first started talking. Spinal cord injury is my academic research. There is a tendency in the country. So I've been trying to work with a lot of groups in India over the years. And one of the issues that I always face is I'm not a clinician by training. And that often seems to be this big issue that everyone has, that you're not a clinician, but you're coming and trying to tell us clinicians what, you, what we can do. And that has to break down. That inter, for having an interdisciplinary conversation, we need to stop having those ego hassles, to be honest. And that seems to be a big cumbersome process in India. Um, being an Indian, having been there 20 years ago, grew, grew up there, it's something that I've all still got issues with. In terms of funding, so, so it needs to be a three-way conversation and something that we are also leading here. And uh, so one thing that Santil picked up was, or mentioned, was about the way the patient and the clinician are not talking to each other. The patient's not being spoken to. And everyone sort of touched upon that, Komal hinted on that as well. We have started a process here where we are trying to identify, is there a means, is there a platform that we can establish so, so we can bring the clinicians, the patients, and whoever it is, the other person, so let's say an app developer or an assistive device developer, to actually start talking to all three parties, to identify what are the features that is minimum required for it to become most adapted. So there are things that, little sort of studies that one can do, almost an experimental thinking. We are applying for funds through charities. So here, one of the things that we do is we often apply for a charity grant to get a small process moving because I heard a lot of questions about funding. And so those are not a lot large amount of money, but they're sort of risk, sort of gets rid of the risk to an extent. You get a bit of data and then you apply for the bigger grants, which is where we go to the government, where our success rates are as low as 3% right now, 3 to 6% at this point. But that's how you do it. So I completely agree that we need to have improved data, um, capture capabilities, and I again agree with all the comments about activity, that sometimes basic exercise is what is key. And I, I've come across still in certain parts of the country where people will go, oh, he's injured, so he, they shouldn't move. But in fact, movement is what is needed to improve that functionality or re reestablish some of those connections that we know can be used to sort of introduce, so establish the neuroplasticity that is useful. Um, there was one comment I didn't quite appreciate. I will make that uh, very obvious, which was about the IITs and the NITs. Yes, I agree that they are the hubs and the innovation centers. I come from St. Xavier's, Bombay. So not an IIT person. And I did zoology purely because of the same reason that we didn't have any access to neuroscience. And I, I, I'm, I like physics and math more than so I used to, I should say, uh, because I landed up having to do zoology, biochemistry, because that was the only way I could study nervous system. That's the closest I could get. So that's a, it's a long-winded process. And I have an issue with the training and the education because often when I'm trying to train students here, coming from India, I find that their knowledge about the central nervous system is really, really poor. And I would wholeheartedly get involved if anybody wants me to be, uh, to help with changing that sector in, in, the, in the sense of what is being taught. Spinal cord is very poorly understood in the field itself. In India, it's even worse, to be honest. Biomedical engineering and bioengineering, which are very active in the country at this point, are very focused on the molecular side of things. They're not looking at that functional recovery. A lot of the research that's happening is again, focusing on the molecules, very much focused on nanotechnology, but they haven't been often addressed with the view of how do we actually translate this in the Indian environment? There needs to be a conversation where I feel, since now I know about the Spinal Foundation, I, I wasn't aware of it, I have to confess, um, <laughs> that there is a centralized body where you can start having these conversations about what are the key things, what are the key research topics that need to be addressed instead of just addressing anything and everything. 
So there is a whole group of people I know who are doing nanotechnology work with micromolecules and uh, liposomal release, which is great, but that's not the immediate need in the nation. So I think there needs to be a segregation of short-term and long-term goals. So it needs a long lot of conversation is what I would stop at because otherwise we'll keep on going. Uh, I will just keep on going. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, uh, Samit. I think you've actually touched on an extremely important and also a difficult area because uh, our, our research um, sort of uh, development is very weak and it needs to be strengthened, no doubt. I, I would like to now open it up to if there are any comments from, uh, I know we've almost reached the time, but if there are one or two questions from or comments from the uh, other participants. I don't know whether anything has been coming in on the chat box. From uh, Senthil, would you know, or Nishad, uh, would any participant like to uh, come in at this stage? I think it's 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 so far what I'm seeing is uh, it's a, it's a big thank you for everybody from some of the participants that uh, I think uh, it's greatly appreciated. Would any of the uh, panelists like to you know just uh, come in with any other comment? Komal, yeah. maybe. Is I, I just want to say one thing. I, I, it has been brought out uh, by many people. Some it said the same. We have to get together on a common platform without any ego. There is an issue. I think everybody will agree with this. Between the crosstalk between the medical professionals and the rehab professionals everywhere. So I think uh, that's where uh, our role should be. The crosstalk has to open. Unless that opens, nothing will happen. The second point is there has to be basic research, and then that should be driving everything else. Thank you. Um, thanks, Komal. Um, maybe uh, I, I should just mention that there is this effort going on to uh, advocate for rehabilitation for all, because uh, the w, there is a move to try and get the government of India. As you know, the health minister of India currently chairs the executive board of the World Health Organization. And there is a, a, a group of people who are largely from the rehab field, who are actually trying to work to uh, uh, try and get WHO to have a resolution in the next year and, and also in 2022. On this, uh, on this topic, and many of the points that have been raised in today's very rich discussion can probably play uh, feed into that process. So hopefully we may try and keep um, um, all of you all involved in that, and uh, maybe Senthil could keep this communication platform going. Uh, is there one more question? Yes, uh, Dr. Thelma, this is Bhuvneshwari uh, from APD. So uh, one of the thoughts was like, uh, during the prevention of stroke revive or cardiac arrest, we had this massive campaigns of FAST and CPR so that even a general, a normal individual could perform a CPR or identify in case of uh, stroke. So is there something that we can think of where a spine, in case of when a person has a fall or a trauma or an accident, that even the general person who is, because in India we see like everyone is very helpful and that is really not helpful for the person who's uh, gone through the trauma because in trying to, you know, lift the person out of the scene of the accident, uh, they are going to cause more injury. So if there's something on a national level or the government level, which ca constantly pumps in this idea as to how it was done for the uh, CPR in the UK or the FAST, uh, I think that will be a, Good start to in the first place uh, uh, prevent uh, you know spinal injuries uh, becoming very serious uh, that was one thought and the second one was in terms of courses like when we have courses in the colleges uh, like uh, someone mentioned there's not really much about spinal cord injury it is a chapter 
and secondly you know on our clinical placements and internship we really don't get we see uh, patients in the hospital in the acute stage and once they are discharged we are not posted to any kind of rehabilitation center that sees these uh, uh, you know uh, beneficiaries for 3 or 4 months and see how they turn out and reintegrate into the community so that would be one area at least master level students because it's a very uh, 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 mentally draining kind of uh, rehabilitation as well those who are ready for it to train them specifically in spinal cord injury in these kind of rehab settings that would be something uh, which uh, uh, you know institutions and colleges could take up so yes thank you bhuvaneshwari i think uh, nishad also has a point to raise on stigma was it nishad or somebody else Uh, you have questions in the chat box. Uh, I would just like to read the questions from the panelists. I agree. The one of the participants have raised a question like, "How do we handle stigma in the field of additional robotic devices?" Would be happy if Sujada Ma'am can share her experience and also about the aesthetics of making a device for a patient. Sujada, would you like to answer that question? Response? Yeah, I, I'm not sure the, um, what the question. Um, I think if you're talking about like exoskeletons and uh, things like that, uh, I think those are still far away from becoming uh, mainstream. Um, they, you know, because there are a lot of. Uh, technologies that go into these devices that need to be say miniaturized and you know um, like batteries and motors and uh, things like that which uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of technological advancement that has to happen in those for these devices to become more aesthetic and more usable in uh, real life situations so i think that's one of the reasons even in the western countries these devices haven't really uh, uh, taken off um, and i i hope i have answered the question but i'm not quite sure uh, uh, whether that is what uh, uh, the intent of that question was i'm sorry yeah. no that's fine i think um, maybe you all can have uh, the person can contact you uh, yeah, sure sure on. they can email me uh, yeah. So maybe we have reached the the end time. I think uh, maybe gone a little over. So I would request uh, Mr. Nakina to. to uh, they, tell me, they somebody has asked about a short term training program for patients. I think that would be if somebody could just address that question. That would probably be a good. Uh, sure. Would anybody like and to? The question is like uh, what they have asked is if the patients expect for a speedy recovery and very short duration stay in the hospital. so is there any other management apart from a quick wheelchair training which you can suggest for such kind of people who wants a speedy discharge from the hospital okay um so i think this this sentil here um so to soundarya to answer your question i can say that uh, as far as spinal cord injury patients are concerned the first and foremost thing for particularly for a short term goal is to prevent uh, secondary complications so building their capacities to understand and manage the secondary complication would help them if you are thinking about a, a kind of a very short term a short term uh, admission and as you rightly pointed out that further in case if you wanted to be independent the second thing what we can definitely think about is wheelchair skills and uh, activities of day training them for activities of daily living so those two are very important things uh, which comes next uh, next uh, um, before the locomotor training is what i can suggest okay and uh, so maybe i will now request uh, nakina to please uh, while close the session for us thank you thank you very much uh, dr dharma narayan uh, it has been i don't know how this time uh, passed just like that you know like it has been very engaging and absorbing uh, session uh, uh, thanks to the organizer for putting developing the entire concept uh, the entire concept about what are the challenges we are facing what in in spinal cord rehabilitation and uh, we have a very wide experience uh, a galaxy of uh, uh, panel uh, right starting with uh, monica start and dr mohanty mr sanjeev 
Dr. Komal, Dr. Sujata, Dr. Samit, and uh, Thelma Narayan for anchor anchoring the entire session. And uh, we also have a lot of participants. I could see close to about uh, 65 participants for, uh, from uh, all across. Uh, that's something very overwhelming, overwhelming for all of us. Uh, it has been very, very engaging uh, session. Thanks to everyone for your uh, views, for your research, for uh, mentioning you know, all that uh, that has been happening, all that, that we can do further uh, in spinal cord uh, uh, re rehabilitation. And I think this is very, very fitting uh, a discussion on an on a international uh, spinal cord uh, day. I think uh, that's something uh, that uh, we all should be uh, really grateful for. Yeah. Uh, with those uh, comments, I want to thank uh, Jacob Kurian for his support. I want to thank MJ Arvind for his support and particular uh, Dr. Sintil for the entire concept and uh, uh, no, for taking it uh, forward. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Nakina. <laughs> and Santil, three cheers for Santil and team. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's true. Thank you, our panelists. Very much. Yeah. So goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yes. Thank you.